you know, you can knock out a set. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for coming back on, Steve. Um, it's been a long time since we've talked. Um, I mean, How long? Is uh, I think we talked back in November the last time. We talked about oh, your new mobility no, no. series. I've done enough of these shows. I, I, it just all runs together. I kind of oh, I know. It. Yeah. Well, and I, haven't, I never miss one. Every time you're on, um, when are you planning on going back to England, if ever? I guess right now to go back on Brian Rose. I uh, I really like Brian. He's a really good guy. My wife told me I should wear a should have worn a suit today to be more like Brian. So, but I told her I, I just can't do it. That's Brian, not me. But uh, I'm not a suit guy either. I always said any restaurant or any place where I would have to have a coat and tie, I just I just don't want to go there. Yeah, well, and you're going to get an overpriced steak and an, a really overdone potato probably anyway. So. <laughs> um, so, Steve, what do you think about everything that's going on right now in terms of, you know, this coronavirus situation and uh, just the chaos that's happening in the world? I mean, how are you managing through it? Well, I mean, as I showed you earlier, uh, I'm pretty isolated just naturally. I'm living in a very rural community. I think we've had all of nine cases in this county, Jefferson County here, mm -hmm. so far. Um, I've talked to three people that I know directly that got infected, and you know, it, it was no worse than just a bad cold. They said they've had colds that were a lot worse. So um, I'm not I'm not trying to undermine the the stress and so forth and pain that people have gone through with this. I'm just saying, though, let's, you got to put it in perspective because the media likes to really whip up the fear. And yeah. I think it's fear that's more dangerous than the actual virus. And uh, the, uh, I mean, if you look at the statistics, it's just a very infinitesimal small amount of people that have been infected so far. I mean, if you look at the population and you did your math, I mean, it's less than one tenth of one percent, right? Yeah. And I mean, if you look at things like traffic accidents, like thirty-seven thousand people died last year in traffic accidents. So I mean, that kind of puts it in perspective, right? Sure. No one said don't drive. Yeah. I so, agree. you know, I, I, I'm not trying to undermine it, but it does seem that the people that are dying are already sick people. They have bad health, bad immune systems. They've already been suffering from something else, you know. So, I mean, in my mind, if you're a strong, healthy person, you've been eating well, you've been exercising, even if you do get it, it's a real pain in the butt, obviously. Yep. No one gets sick. I'm just saying, it, it, it's not dire consequence. Yeah, for sure. You know, yeah, it, it, the people that are dying, have already, they're already sick people. They're already unhealthy people. So, you know, I'm not trying to be unfeeling, but I'm just trying to, people just need to put it in perspective. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do your your social duty and, you know, uh, not self-quarantine and so forth. I'm not advocating, you know, ignoring. Uh, I'm just saying that you don't have to be too worried if you're strong, healthy. I just read about a 99-year-old that got it and recovered. They obviously, have, you know, really good health. Mm -hmm. So, but it does seem like it's the elderly. And it's not just because they're elderly. It's just that most people in the U.S. have very poor health. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, even though we're a very rich, powerful nation, uh, the health of the average person in the U.S. is not good. We lead the world in obesity. And, you know, we're like the, the fattest, sickest nation on earth. I mean, really, truly, uh, the fast foods and the sugars and, and the, the kind of crap people put in their bodies. Uh, for sure, we're, we're one of the fattest nations on earth. And it's no wonder to me that people's immune systems are so impaired, they can't fend off this, this, this virus. Yeah. So uh, it's just my two cents. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, well, one of the reasons that I wanted to have you come back on today is I've heard you talk a lot about John Tilden, toxemia explained, and this crisis of overburdening our bodies. 
And I thought it would be helpful if maybe you could talk through that theory a little bit and then relate it to some things that folks can do to sort of, um, while they're at home, focus on, on getting themselves into a better position to fight it off should they get it. Of course, we're not going to make any claims about cures or anything, but, but just some general concepts related to John Tilden's work. Well, he was a really interesting guy. Uh, by the way, Tilden was not the inventor of any of this. Mm -hmm. The ideas he's talking about were thousands of years old. Uh, they come from Ayurveda, the first medical system. And uh, this was all based on empirical evidence and observational medicine. You know, you, you have your double blind modern studies. But there's also another type of science of observation and empirical data. And it was observed that by simplifying meals, and not overburdening your digestion by eating a lot of stuff, you know, mixing a lot of different foods in, the, in, in one meal, that you enhance your ability to digest food. And digestion and gut health are absolutely instrumental in uh, building your immune system. And now more and more is being discovered all the time. You know, uh, you hear this uh, about gut biome, and, you know, people are trying to cash in on it. But, I mean, basically, by just really eating simple, simple meals. What am I talking about? Uh, some people refer to this system as food combining. This is uh, John Tilden was a turn-of-the-century American doctor. He used food as a cure. Food as medicine, which is not new. But he had tremendous success uh, treating people for so-called incurable diseases. He had success with uh, curing people from tuberculosis, uh, syphilis, gonorrhea, uh, all through fasting and dieting, you know. And it's not popular with the medical community who have amazing, immense power in the United States. You know, it's, it's, it's all about big pharmaceutical companies and drugs. And, you know, someone's going to make billions of dollars off this damn virus, I guarantee it. Oh yeah, you know, I mean they there's companies they're going to come up with the miracle, the miracle, you know the the shot that's going to protect everyone, and someone's going to make billions. It, it just makes you wonder sometimes, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I of course conspiracy theories a little bit, but you know because I I don't trust uh, medicine at all. I I believe very strongly that your body is capable of building an immunity to almost any disease. Yeah. Even during the most virulent plague of all time, the bubonic plague in Europe. I mean, if you read, uh, millions of millions of people died. Of course, they didn't know what we do now. They didn't know about hygiene and so forth. But you know, millions of people died. But there were some people that got sick and died immediately. There were some people that got sick and languished and then they died. There were some people that got very sick and then healed. They, you know, they survived. There's some people that got sick only with mild symptoms, and then there were some people that didn't get sick at all. What was the difference? Mm -hmm. Immunity. Yeah. Some people might point out genetics, you know, maybe, but for the most part, you know, people with strong immune systems uh, have survived all diseases. Yeah. And what good immunity? Good gut health. What creates good gut health? Proper diet, eating properly. What's a proper diet? Well, it's certainly not the American diet. Yeah. <laughs> it's certainly not over-processed uh, you know, foods that, that, you, that you buy, canned and plastic bottled foods and fast food and so forth. For sure, I don't think anyone could argue that eating fresh produce and uh, organically uh, uh, produced, locally grown fruits and vegetables and so forth as a basis of a diet, lean proteins, uh, I don't like that term paleo diet, but I, I, I do believe that uh, eating a simple, unprocessed uh, diet is the best way to go. And the, the way the uh, children would organize the food, he would have like a fruit-based meal, uh, simple fruits, pretty much on an empty stomach, and um, a starch-based meal, uh, whole grains and so forth, uh, possibly mixed with some vegetables. and. Uh, then a protein-based meal. Protein being uh, lean meats, poultry, fish, 
eggs, you know, that type of thing, uh, with a vegetable meal, let's say a large, uh, large salad, mm-hmm. something like that. And that's, that's pretty much how I eat. Have you? Uh, like t- a typical meal for me. Uh, the other day, I did hours and hours of yard work and cleaned out this old shed. I mean, um, I wear a Fitbit. And I ended up with almost 20,000 steps, just going back and forth, cleaning the crap out of this old shed that was on the property. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it was pretty exhausting because some of the stuff was kind of heavy, old busted up stuff that uh, Teresa's dad had stored away. Mm-hmm. That he tended to be a bit of a hoarder. So they, he had hoarded all this crap. And, uh, just, and then there was old squirrel's nest. I found dead rats in there. I mean, oh, my God, you know. They used to keep chickens, and there was this chicken feed that had gone bad, and I was just di- ripping the stuff out of it and carrying it uh, like 100 yards over to a place uh, to be picked up by this guy that does hauling. So it was very exhausting work. Mm-hmm. And I, I worked that morning with just cold brew coffee mixed with coconut water. That was like about 9 o'clock after I did my morning routine. Mm-hmm. Then I had two oranges about a half an hour after that. I'm sorry, three oranges, three big California naval oranges. And that was it. And I worked like an animal till about two o'clock, nonstop, back and forth and back and forth, lifting heavy stuff, hauling stuff, uh, filling trash bags full of crap. And then I had my chief meal. And it was just uh, venison, venison uh, stew. And then uh, with a large raw vegetable salad, uh, romaine lettuce, uh, some chopped up um, beets. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, th- these beets had already been uh, like pickled with uh, some cucumbers, uh, a few tomatoes, and uh, a couple bell peppers uh, and so forth yeah. uh, with the light dressing. And then I didn't have anything else. Uh, and so about five hours later, I just had a few uh, whole grain crackers. So, yeah. I mean, light, easy, easy to digest. Yeah, I think people overestimate how much they actually need to eat every day. And, yeah. you know, I have a friend, his name is Zach Blaine. Um, we did an interview with him a couple of weeks ago where he's been going, uh, he's on day 99 or 100 of uh, one meal a day. And he, he's an incredibly active, uh, unconventional coach out in uh, Oregon and he lost about eight pounds and then his body normalized it adjusted to eating the one meal a day, which he eats in a very small window between like four or six uh, or something like that, four and eight. But he, he's, he's, he wanted to do it to show people and his clients that you don't need six meals a day. You don't need a big, huge starchy breakfast every morning and you can thrive and actually be healthier on, on a lot less meals on a lot fewer meals, even if you're active. Yeah. I mean, your metabolism will slow down. And, you know, people always talk about, oh, I want my metabolism to be fast. Why? The fastest metabolism is like a mouse, right? Mm-hmm. And they only live for about a year and a half, two years. Mm-hmm. I used to eat mice when I was a little kid as pets. Mm-hmm. They don't live very long. Animals with fast metabolisms die early. The elephant lives almost 65, 70 years, has a very slow metabolism. Mm-hmm. You know, a blue whale big giant creature but they live a really long time you know i think 70 80 years or something like that the galapagos tortoise that lives well over 100 years very slow metabolism if you want to increase your lifespan you got to slow the metabolism down you don't want to be you know heart heart rate beating and and uh, a fast metabolism because you're just burning up all your life force and life energy yeah so these Infrequent feedings really slow the metabolism down. I, I frequently only en- end up with two meals a day. Mm-hmm. Uh, I happen to have a little bit more. You can kind of count that coffee with the coconut water as a meal because, I mean, you know, coconut water has calories. But usually about every five hours I'll, I'll have the meal. And a lot of times I'll push that first meal back many, many hours to where I want to have Anything other than coffee and coconut water to literally, you know, one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon. Yep. And then five hours later, have another meal. So a lot of the times it's only two meals a day. You don't need to eat a lot. Yeah. I'm the same way. 
And that's a scary thing for a lot of Americans. You know, most Americans have never, ever had true biological hunger. Never. In their life. Mm -hmm. The first little tummy rumbling, they begin to panic and they feel I need to eat. And, you know, I feel weak and I feel dizzy and, you know, all, all this stuff. But I'll tell you what will cure that is just doing a fast for 48 hours. Lay in bed if you have to. That will teach your body what true biological hunger is. But most people do not know true biological hunger. My, uh, no my partner, Kevin, is in the middle of a 48-hour fast right now. Um, they And him and Dr. Mark Testa, who, who work with us also, they do a, like a prolon fast, which is five days where you basically, I don't know if you've heard of prolon, but it's basically um, a five day fast where you eat these specific meals that are lacking nutrients that would take your body out of the fast. Um, and they recommend doing even, you know, periodically doing this just to so give your body a break and cleaning itself out. I've never gone personally longer than 36 hours, but I can tell you, I, I never really felt like I needed to eat in 36 hours. I just... I've done I've done 10 day fast. Whoa. Okay. And, you know, um, I, I did a 14 day juice fast, you know, just having uh, fresh juice uh, uh, made in a juicer, a mm -hmm. uh, way of um, cleansing. And also uh, I, I was actually suffering with a cold from hell. And uh, I just, uh, the best, best way to handle any kind of disease, cold, flu, is to fast and your body will be able to uh, use all its resources to combat the illness. Uh, a lot of people don't realize just how much energy it takes to digest food. So you know, a lot of your energy is diverted to the digestive tract and it, it's, it's harder to fight disease. So this, this, you know, this whole idea of, of eating when you're sick, it's, you're just gonna prolong the illness. You know, you, you heard the old saying, uh, I think, uh, starve a cold, feed a, feed a fever. Yeah. That's not the accurate quote. That wasn't the original quote. Dr. Tilden talks about this in his book. The original quote was, if you feed a cold, you'll have to starve a fever. Uh -huh. Meaning you eat when you get cold symptoms, then it's going to the cold is going to become worse and become a flu, right? And then you're going to have to starve. Then you're going to have to fast because you won't be heavy because you'll probably be throwing up and nauseous and everything. So as the first sign of cold symptoms, you need to fast. Yeah. Well, you can read about this. Dr. Children's book, even though it was written almost 100 years ago, it doesn't mean it's not applicable to today. It, it's just it's even more applicable in, in, in some ways. Yeah. He basically gave you the keys to the kingdom, how you can protect your health and not need modern medicine at all. Yeah. I haven't seen a doctor in 35 years. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not bragging about it. I just don't need it. Yeah. And I don't care to get into the medical system. So, you know, I've been using this, this type of food combining, you know, simple, simplified meals infrequent eating, fasting, uh, for years and years, very successful. And uh, it, it's worked for me. So I would encourage other people to try it. Um, I will. Uh, I, well, well, once again, one, one person, you know, isn't enough. Yeah. But I've seen and talked to many, many, many people over the decades, all with the same story. So those that wish to be independent of the, you know, the medical drug industrial complex might want to check out children's books. They're all free online. There's this one uh, resource called the Soil and Health Library mm -hmm. uh, that you, uh, it's free, but uh, they do ask for donations. You know, it's good to donate. And they have all children's books there. Also, you can get PDF of all children's books, Tuxima Explained all his old newsletters and so forth, uh, free. It's free information on the, on, on the web. Okay. And I, I'd encourage people to read the philosophy. It's, it's really good. Yeah. And I, echoing what the yogi said, you know, 4,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we have By a, the way, I, I keep dabbing my nose. Uh, before uh, I, I went on, I did a nutty part. Oh, okay. I thought maybe it was. It's always embarrassing because sometimes the water trickles. Yeah. From the from the net from the netty pot. Oh, yeah. It can be embarrassing sometimes. You're oh, talking. No but, worries. Yeah. I was afraid of sneezing and rubbing my eyes. All the flowering <laughs> trees here in Colorado have got me suffering. So I made sure to take an Allegra before we got. By on. the way, the the the, uh, the pollen sensitivity uh, is uh, due to toxicity of your body. You may want to look into that. Well, you carry a, a burden of toxin. Okay. I do you notice. Pollens like, and things shouldn't, shouldn't bug anyone. Yeah. Anyone who suffers from allergies, what does the doctor do? They give some kind of drug to cover the symptoms. But why are the pollens and so forth bugging you? Yes. Yeah. There was a time in your life where it probably did it. It's because of uh, toxic buildup in the body. A certain level of toxinia. Mm -hmm. uh, a good twenty-four hour fast would would do marvels for you. A lot of these counter drugs, you know, uh, seem so harmless. Yeah. You know, ibuprofen and and uh, Tylenol. You know, all this Advil. Uh, it, it can really toxify the liver and really damage the kidneys. And uh, now they've even linked Advil to um, heart attack. Oh, yeah. And I've also heard ibuprofen linked to low testosterone and low sperm counts. Uh, in, so, you know, it seems like a panacea. Yeah. I can remember time before I knew this stuff where I was kind of popping those things somewhat regularly. And I actually had my liver tested and uh, it, it, was on, it was on the weaker side. Yeah. And once I started taking all that crap, the uh, liver uh, came back big time. Mm -hmm. This is back, you know, many, many years ago when I didn't know any better. I, I, I would take over the counter stuff. And I have had ta uh, pollen sensitivities at various times, but I always know that's when it's time for a fast. Okay. Yeah, I've noted, you mentioned Did food combining earlier, and I've, I've, I follow some of the carnivore guys. I don't personally follow a 100% carnivore diet mm -hmm. myself, but um, a lot of what they say in terms of benefits um, are di improved digestive health and also um, less inflammation and less allergic reactions to things. Um, I, I don't know if you think that's because it, those carnivore people are strictly eating one food and they're not combining a bunch of stuff. And so you're naturally eliminating things that would burden the body. Um, That'd be part of it. That'd be part of it. Um, there's, cer there's certainly nothing uh, superior about veganism or vegetarianism. There's some of the sickest, unhealthiest people I've ever met. Um, but one of the big no-nos in almost every food combining system, and there's more than one, but even the yogi said this thousands of years ago, don't mix protein and starch. Don't have chicken and rice or steak and potatoes or a hamburger in a, in a bun with bread or whatever. If you're going to eat protein, eat protein. It, you can have fresh vegetables or some cooked greens with it, you know, like broccoli or, uh, you know, like uh, collards or, so, you know, asparagus, something like that. But do not eat starch with protein. It, uh, it's, it's really hard to digest. It takes a lot out of the body. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the theories of aging is called the glycation theory. Uh, when you eat, uh, when you burden your body with a lot of starch and protein in the same meal, you form glycated protein. It's like this sticky glue-like substance that uh, it, it can it stiffens your arteries. It, it can even make your tissues and your joints and stuff stiff. Uh -huh. It's it's no good, man. Yeah. Um, I definitely yeah. notice that when I mix a lot of food, I have more uh, digestive issues and bloating and gas. And when I eat a simple meal or do, or just a protein meal, a lot a lot of that stuff goes away. It just seems like. Uh, th th I mean, that's that's the key. Yeah. I mean, if the people listening, if your digestion is good, you know, if you're not having farting or distended ab, uh, abdomen or bloating, uh, you're having uh, a couple bowel movements every day, uh, you don't get frequent colds or flu or allergies or any of this stuff, then obviously you're doing the right thing. Don't change anything. But if you are getting somewhat frequent colds and you get sick with the flu, 
and you have you know abdominal distress, bloating, constipation, or diarrhea, or whatever. Obviously, whatever you're doing ain't, ain't working. Mm -hmm. That's how you can tell whether your diet's working or not. You know, and of course, number one, you're not fat. If you're fat and obese, and you have a lot of unwed, unwanted body fat, obviously you're eating too much, and your diet's not working for you. Why do you eat too much? Because you're hungry. Why are you hungry? Because you're not getting your nutritional needs met. So you're in a chronic state of this, what I call false hunger. Now, some people eat for emotional reasons also. But when, when, when you're on a good diet, you don't get hungry all the time. You know? part, part of the, another part of the equation, people don't even talk about that much anymore. They used to. is really chewing the food up. Masticating the food properly. A lot of people just literally tear into their meal and gulp it down, drinking a lot of liquid with no good, man. Yeah. You should, you should take a bite, chew it pretty much to liquid, you know, put your fork down between bites, you know, really masticate. You'll instantly cut the amount of food down by about a third, at least, by doing that. You'll just, you'll feel much more sated. Yeah. Well, I'm super guilty. Of you level. You won't feel the need to overeat. By the way, I want people to know I'm no doctor. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a dietitian. Yeah. I have no credentials, but I have, you know, I'm 67 years young and I've had impeccable health throughout my entire life. I started getting really interested in uh, health and fitness when I was just a kid. And as a teenager in Cornwall, Pennsylvania. So basically, basically, the things I'm talking about right now are from my own experience. And I've worked with thousands and thousands of young men and women in the fitness business. And I have had a chance to observe these things for myself. So you don't need to be a doctor or scientist to be able to just look and see and observe. Yep. So this is advice that's coming from an old dude that's been around for a while. Take it or leave it. Yeah. Well, that's why we like But to Once again, you know, if your system's working for you, then, you know, don't change anything. Yeah. But I would venture to say that most people's diet systems aren't working. Yeah. Well, that's why we want to have you on, Steve, because uh, we, I, I kind of imagine if everybody um, followed your advice to live the way you do, we would be in a lot better situation than we are now. And I've, I've been following you for years. I try to implement a lot of the stuff I've heard you talk about through, um, you know, the different shows you've been on and our conversations we've had over the last few years. So um, I did want to switch. To and by the way, I didn't invent any of this. This is all stuff I learned through mentors. I've had some amazing teachers and coaches in my time. And, you know, just from my own research. Mm -hmm. And, you know, certain truths would kind of jump out at you. They're the things that I'd really pay attention. There would just be like the ring of truth about a certain idea or philosophy that would just say, okay. And then I just try it. Yeah. Cool. So, I mean, I, I encourage people to self experiment. Um, switching gears, I wanted to talk about working out. I know a lot of people right now are struggling with gyms closed and a lack of equipment in their house uh, to. Aside from being able to walk and go outside, um, you know, what ideas do you have or tips would you have for people training inside, trying to stay in shape while they're locked in their houses? Well, I stopped going to gyms a long time ago because I found them to be almost the antithesis of good workouts. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, a lot of crazy stuff out there. Um, a lot of the ways, first of all, let, let me first say, that the single most important thing a person can do to preserve their youth and vitality is strength training. And for people that don't do strength training, they're really handicapping themselves. And I'm not talking about um, yoga or Pilates. They, they, those two things can be done in a way that is productive, but I'm talking about fairly intense muscular exercise where you're really working and pitting your muscles against a high level of resistance. It's very important to understand the difference between weight and resistance. Resistance and weight are not the same thing. 
the amount of weight can increase the resistance, but a clever person can use a relatively light weight. And by shortening the lever arm and manipulating the range of motion and going slow, very slow, smooth reps, they can make a lightweight very, very hard without stressing the joints and the connective tissue. A lot of people fear this idea of strength training. They worry about getting, I don't want to get too big. That's the silliest thing I ever heard. You know how hard it is to get big muscles? I tried all my life. I wanted to have big G whiz muscles. No way. The, the ability to gain a lot of muscular size and strength is about the same genetics as height. You know, if we went down to a local shopping mall, let's say, once the quarantine is lifted. <laughs> And we were to observe people. We'd see most people about our size. I'm guessing, what are you, about 5'10", maybe? 5'9", uh, 1'6". Okay, yeah, me, I'm about 5'8". But most people are between 5'6", five, 5'10", five, right? That's average height. But we'd see a few people that are really short, little people. Maybe even, maybe a midget, like really tiny. And then we would see people above average height, just a few, above average. And then we might see a giant, like a guy damn near seven foot tall, like a basketball player guy, and they really stand out. Well, that's about the same propensity as people have for muscular size. Very few people, no matter how hard they try, even if they take anabolic steroid drugs, are going to get big, giant muscles. So the average person does not have to worry about that at all. Even if they were to take anabolic steroid drugs, they still wouldn't be able to get huge muscles like a bodybuilder. Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of guys that are big and muscular, and they all collect in one place, the local gym. You know, it's kind of like selection bias. All the guys that have a propensity for muscle size are all in one place. It's the gym. But they represent a very infinitesimal small portion of the population. Yeah. So. People do not need to worry, and especially uh, as a woman, they, uh, because they don't have the hormone, uh, the, the, the testosterone of a, a, of a man, they don't have to worry about getting huge muscles. Are you familiar with Dr. Doug McGuff? I am. Yeah. I like Dr. McGuff very much. I, he, excellent book called Body by Science. Yeah. I recommend everyone in watching this show. Read Tilden's Toxemia Explained. And then go and read Dr. McGuff's Body by Science. We um, we interviewed Dr. McGuff, and he he used talked about the same thing that you did with CrossFit. People watch the CrossFit Games and think, well, if I do CrossFit, I'll look like a CrossFit athlete. But that's a selection bias. If you go all the way down to your local CrossFit competition, you'll see people of all shapes and sizes. By the time you get to the podium, CrossFit is weeded out and genetically selected those that are best suited for that style of competition and it doesn't matter how much crossfit you do you're not going to look like the guys in the games because they're genetically their genetic makeup is what helps them to be good at crossfit not crossfit well, training itself. think of any sport yeah like i mean any system is going to bring you to your genetic potential within about three to five years doesn't matter mm -hmm. bodybuilding type volume training uh, power lifting olympic lifting uh, gymnastics kind of training, uh, in the hood kind of calisthenics training, uh, isometrics, um, doesn't matter. If it's, you know, if you're working hard, you're going to reach your genetic potential for size and strength within about three to five years. doesn't matter what you do. Mm -hmm. The main difference is the wear and tear on your body. You want to pick a system that is safe and doesn't put all that wear and tear on your joints you're going to end up with a lot of osteoarthritis. So if you look at, let's say, gymnasts, for example, they have pretty amazing bodies. And when you look in the Olympics, they're some of the finest specimens ever. But you go to the college level, you'll see a lot of just, you know, different types of physiques competing, but still, you know, all pretty muscular. Then you go to the high school, and you'll see all size, sizes and shapes. So 
if that selection bias weeds out the ones that do not have the genetic potential for, you know, like you said, being on, uh, on the garden. You also have to remember survival bias. The people that can survive the training that don't destroy their limbs, you know, like CrossFit games or, or you know, competitive gymnastics or Olympic weightlifting, the people that can survive the training are the ones that you see in the medals. But, you know, you never see an old gymnast, you know, and you don't see older CrossFit athletes unless they started when they were old. Yeah. They usually last for a couple of years. Same thing in my game. I'm a sixth degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu from the Gracie family. I've been competing in grappling since I was 12 years old. It's hard in your body. You're not a wear and tear. I've suffered a lot of injuries. You know, I, I wake up, you know, with, with injuries every day. There's, you know, there's, there's a price to be paid for playing those kind of sports. I'm a lot more careful these days. I still roll even at 67. Mm -hmm. I'm just very careful who I roll with. But I never, no one ever said that was a safe way. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the confusion is when people uh, will take a sport or a recreation and confuse it with exercise. Maybe Dr. McGuff talked about the difference between recreation versus exercise. Yep. So, so exercise we, should prevent injuries and exercise should allow us to play our sport better. Yeah. Like for example, I haven't done manual labor since forever, man, since I was in college right? Heavy manual labor. Yet I was able to go out there and literally clean out a shed filled with so much shit you wouldn't believe. And a lot of heavy stuff. Old cans, buckets full of stuff. I mean, I've worked like a manual labor. Oh, lumber, hauling lumber, plywood, all these old beams and boards and, and everything. And I was able to do that. You know? Uh, the other day, I had to go out and dig. Dig holes. I was able to do it. Yeah. Because my strength training allows me to do it. But those work, that, that type of work is not exercise. No. It, 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 uh, there's no way you can measure it, for one thing. And it, it, it is somewhat hard in the body, a lot of wear and tear. So my exercise allows me to enjoy my recreation and allows me be, to be able to work hard when I need to. That's a big confusion. Recreation and exercise, work and exercise, completely opposite topics. Yep. Everyone needs some form of strength training. In fact, this morning, I worked out my 83-year-old uh, mother-in-law, Teresa's mom, uh, doing time steady contraction isometrics with nothing more than a yoga block, a strap, a table, and a chair. It was like a table workout. And a very productive workout. And she has a really nice little figure for an 83-year-old woman. And she, she works outside in the garden eight, nine hours at a time. And very mobile. She can do full flat foot squats to stay in that squat position. So this is what exercise will do for you. So, folks listening, uh, if you're not doing some form of strength training, resist, meaningful resistance training, and it could be barbells, dumbbells, machine training is perfectly fine, uh, isometrics, you know, but done in a safe manner. I'm a big advocate of Ken Hutchins, super slow and time steady contraction, by the way. Um, I was going to ask you for those that don't have any equipment, how, uh, maybe you could describe how to incorporate an isometric or how to properly do that. Maybe some exercise ideas that people could be using right now while they're stuck at home. Yeah. I mean, um, I have a whole workout designed around a strap. Uh, I originally started with just my jujitsu belt when I was traveling. And then, um, there's a device called a forearm forklift, which is really handy. You can buy it on uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, get it off Amazon. There's a cut other beware of the fake straps, but it's a thick nylon strap with loops sewn in the end that are really nice for inserting your feet. And you can do squats, deadlifts, chest press, uh rows, uh pull downs all isometrically with it with the uh, limbs at about the uh ninety degrees, the mid range of most of the compound movements. You can also do isolation exercises like uh, the old Charles Atlas, uh, like chest, chest crush, you know, squeezing your hands together. Uh, I could use this table, uh, you know, do uh, push down or curl up. And the way the time static contract, uh, it's a form of isometrics that has three phases, 30 seconds 
at 50% effort, kind of like the, like if you're doing like a set of push-ups, it'd be like the first couple easy reps. And then the second 30 second phase is 70% effort. That'd be like the more difficult reps in the middle of the set. And then the last 30 seconds as hard as you dare. Whereas I didn't say as hard as you can, as hard as you dare. Uh, you know, you, you want to push yourself as hard as you can, but not at the expense of your joints. So if you feel any joint pain or you feel like you're going to pull something, you just, just back off a tad. But basically, it's as hard as you absolutely can. So three phase, not set, which is way longer than traditional isometrics. Traditional isometrics used to be like all out efforts in 10 seconds. I think that can be dangerous. So uh, uh, it was invented by a fellow by the name of Ken Hutchins. And you can just use a strap, a rope, a belt, and get a fantastic isometric workout. And it translates into dynamic work as well. You know, you, you, you'll, you'll find that what if you've done a month of time study contraction, if you test yourself in a set of push-ups or pull-ups, you'll, you'll find that you'll be better than ever. But um, here's the thing that's hard to swallow for a lot of guys. Once you've been training for about five years, pretty much what you see is what you're going to get. You're not going to get improvements anymore. At that point, you're going to maintain it throughout your life. You know, it'll be some people say, yeah, but I'm getting stronger. I've been training for many years. They're getting stronger because they're, 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 they're equating lifting more weight with being stronger. There are ways that you can get really efficient at doing the bench press or, you know, kettlebell snatch or something. So you can improve by improving the technique and make it more efficient. And you do that by making it easier. And you do that by cheating. Yeah. Leveraging your body in such a way or using momentum or bouncing. So yeah, if and the only people that should be worried about the amount of weight are competitor weightlifters. Yep. Competitor weightlifters should be concerned about weight. But no one ever said it was healthy. No. For the rest, we should be using as light a weight as possible, but making it as hard as possible. And the work has to be hard. The work has to be very demanding in order for your body to retain its muscle. But for me, I've been just basically trying to maintain for the last four decades. You know, I'm not going to get stronger. I'm not going to get more muscle. I'm trying to – it's kind of like putting money in the bank. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, stop the bleeding. Yeah. You're going to lose your muscle anyway, but you're going to, you can slow that down. So I'm trying to maintain and retain as much muscle and strength as I can until I die. Dr. Doug McGuff also has a section in Body by Science where he talks about the – the strength curve and, and it, it, he almost suggests that you shouldn't try to get as strong as possible because as you go up the strength curve your risk of injury goes up and up and you're going to reach your genetic potential for strength at some point at which point if you try to pass that your risk of injury goes through the roof and that's maybe where maybe you dial it back and you stay like talk about stay where you're talking about sort of in the middle uh, a safe weight that you can do and make really intense to keep your health and your strength up Remember, a lot of people get confused between demonstrating strength and building strength. Demonstrating strength would be a single rep max deadlift or single rep squat or something, you know. That's demonstrating strength. Uh, performing an iron cross in the rings or front plants or front lever, like in body weight calisthenics, or uh, maybe people are familiar with the human flag where you hold yourself straight out with your arms in a, 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 a vertical pole. These are all feats of strength. Uh, stunts and demonstrations of strength but it's not the best way to build strength and by performing these feats and stunts and these heavy lifts you do run the risk of injury even if you use good form it, you know it's just by virtue of the fact that you are reaching your structural limits i mean you never know at what point you're going to exceed the, the, the limits that your body structure can handle. You know, one day, and I saw a guy in the gym one day attempting a max bench press. He had warmed up carefully. He was using pretty decent form, but his pec tore clean off the shoulder and rolled right up. It was awful. And I saw another guy attempting a max deadlift. His bicep tore clean off his forearm and rolled right up into the shoulder. Had to be surgically reattached. And they were using good form. It's just that they had exceeded their structural limit with the amount of weight. And there's no reason to do that. 
you can use some maximal weights and achieve whatever level of strength potential that you have. Uh, practicing really heavy lifts is a skill. It's a skill. And a lot of people that do this type of lifting are very skillful and they're very good at using minimum amount of energy and, and leveraging their body in such a way that they can lift more and more and more. And that's their game. That's their sport. That's what floats their boat. What I'm proposing is these things for the average guy or even athletes in other sports like in jiu-jitsu, for example, or MMA or whatever. You don't need that. To, you don't need to develop the skills of lifting these heavy weights. It's just absolutely unnecessary. It does nothing for your sport. And it just puts more unnecessary wear and tear on your joints. So, you know, you end up with a lot of osteoarthritis and stuff. So, just saying. Yeah. That'd be a question. For sure. I used to be in the kettlebells for a while. I kind of fell in love with this kettlebell thing. I'm really sorry I did that. I really messed up my shoulder. I, I developed a real uh, bone spur on the right shoulder, an osteophyte, just, you know, just from pushing some of these lifts and these high repetition movements, ballistic. And any movement that requires like explosion or, or speed. And forget this crap that uh, you can selectively recruit fast twitch muscle fiber. It's, it's not true. There's not, no data to support that, you know? This idea that if you train explosive and fast, you be fast, you know, in sports, it's not true. Yeah. You can move very slowly. You can even not move at all isometrically and build as much explosivity as you're ever going to need. And how do you do it? You take the specific sports skill and do that explosive or fast, like your, you know, your tennis serve yeah. or you know i tell my sons if, if you want to get better at hitting baseballs practice hitting baseballs you want to get in good shape then you work out yeah you want a powerful punch you got to punch yeah. you know you practice on the focus mitts you practice on um, like heavy bag you know that's how you develop your the power of your punch not doing explosive clapping push-ups not exploding a bench press off your chest i see guys like throwing a bench press and catching a barbell I mean, just silly nonsense. You know, kettlebell snatches are not going to make your double A takedown uh, in wrestling any more explosive or doing heavy swings. It's, it's not. You're just wear, placing unnecessary wear and tear on your joints. By the way, a lot of sports injuries aren't caused by the sport itself. You ever see an NFL game? I mean, these are the elite of the elite, you know, yeah. NFL football. I mean, amazingly strong, fast individuals. And uh, you ever see a guy like all of a sudden just grab his hamstring? Uh, like even in non-contact, you wonder, wow, what the hell is going on there? You know, like maybe he ran down for a pass and pulled something. Yeah. Or maybe it will be like light contact and the guy will, will really be hurt. Well, that, that moment in time where he pulled the muscle was not the cause. That injury had been built in the gym using shitty form shitty technique explosive exercise power cleans and mm -hmm. you know just crazy momentum drills a lot of a lot of the a lot of the injuries you see on the basketball court the the gridiron the soccer field the tennis court or the wrestling mat they were built in the gym using poor technique poor form crappy exercises and the over weeks and months the structure had been weakened mm -hmm. you know tendons, the, the, the ligaments, the, and so forth, had been like little micro damage over time. Each workout was like a little insult, and it just, the, the joint, the integrity of the joint just got weaker and weaker and weaker until one day, boom! And then everyone assumed it was what he was doing at that time that caused it. Nope. That had been building for months. Um, what, one last thing. Thanks, Steve. I know we're getting close to uh, time here. Um, what advice would you have for everyone in this situation right now, being locked up for, for stress management, mindset, um, and, and just being as healthy as possible mentally as well as physically throughout all this coronavirus craziness? Well, stop watching TV. Stop listening to your local news. Stop reading the newspaper, you know. Start to go within, start to meditating, read spiritually elevating books. You know, if you're, if you're religious, 
you know, start reading your Quran, your Bible, you know, uh, read the Vedic scriptures, you know, read, read, uh, read the Philokalia, which was like a precursor to the Bible. Uh, start, start looking at uh, other uh, books on mental science and, and do daily affirmations. Uh, for sure, just getting out, just taking walks, uh, doing deep breathing out in nature if you can. Uh, there's some cities. I have a client in Paris. I actually did a Zoom workout. We, uh, we, we actually did a virtual workout. I supervised him through uh, an isometric and body weight calisthenic workout online. He can't even go outside. Paris is one of uh, – right now they're on lockdown where they're not allowed to exercise out, out of door. But unless you're in that situation – Get outside, breathe the fresh air, get the sun. You know, just realize that this will be over. You know, it's not going to last that much longer. Um, you know, it, it seems like a long time when you're stuck, but you know, just keep the faith. It's uh, you cannot allow the fear to take over. Uh, I would recommend a, a a book by Ernest Holmes called The Science of Mind. Uh, it's a bit dry. But if you read that, you have unbelievable confidence in yourself to overcome any situation. It's all based on the idea that uh, another good one is James Allen's uh, classic book, As a Man Thinketh. Basically, in a nutshell, what, whatever you're concentrating on, whatever your belief system is, this is your reality. Your reality is based on your, your thoughts, some total of your positive and negative thoughts. If you're a real negative worry war, you're going to have a pretty shitty life. Everything's always going to be a disaster. And if you're a real positive-minded person, you can create positive situations in your life. Uh, it, it goes beyond that. But, I mean, in a nutshell, I think you'll find this to be true just through observation. So you can control a lot of your environment through your mental science. It's called the universal law of attraction. And I've been using this for years with great effect, and it's been working for me really, really well. But I would say Ernest Holmes, James Allen. But once people start exploring this, uh, this uh, some people refer to it as the new thought. Oh, another good one is uh, Yogananda. He, he wrote uh, The Second Coming of Christ. Uh, fantastic book uh, about Jesus Christ written by a yogi. <laughs> mm -hmm. Really... Uh, he talks. He talks a lot about uh, the the metaphysical meaning behind a lot of uh, biblical passages and so forth. So you don't have to be religious. I'm not religious. I consider myself spiritual. But these are the kind of things you want to be concentrating on. You don't want to be concentrating on fear and doubt, and you know, constantly concentrating on all the things you don't like. Think about the things you do like, and think about the things that you want not the things that you don't want to happen. Because whatever you're concentrating and focusing your thoughts on, this is what you're going to attract through the universal law of attraction. A lot of people aren't aware of this, but it does work. Yep. It, you know, yeah, I agree. I've, I've Read for yourself, man. Yeah. I try to practice, you know, tell, especially when it comes to business or my family, instead of trying to think of all the reasons not to do something, try to tell myself all the reasons I should do something. And, and, and take the risks and what's positive in my life. And I really try to avoid any sort of thoughts that, that creep in that, that counter any of that. Cause then it's just, it's like a disease. It's just, they accumulate and then they take over. By the way, there is a thing called the collective consciousness, you know, where we kind of like the universal consciousness, like everyone right now, the collective is full of fear and doubt and anguish and worry, you know, everything from their health to their finances and so forth. So it's easy to get sucked into that universal mindset. And you got to take great, you know, not every thought that goes into your mind comes from you. Some of these thoughts come from without. So you got to, it's kind of like mental judo or mental jujitsu. You know, when these negative thoughts go in, and you can't control them from coming in. But what you do with the thought, being aware of these, this inner conversation, Every time you get these negative fear thoughts, you got to have positive affirmations to affirm it away. So for every fear thought that I have, I'll put two or even three positive thoughts in my mind. Because, you know, I'm just a man. I'm just a guy. 
I get scared, I get worried, but I, you know, I, I quickly am conscious of why I'm afraid and why I want. And then rather than stewing in it and letting it eat me up from the inside, I will take steps to create positivity and, you know, uh, get in touch with, with the divine. Mm -hmm. Um, well, Steve, I think that uh, takes us right up to the hour. Um, I don't know if there's any programs. You've, you've, you've got a lot of great stuff on your website, and you've talked about a lot of good fitness concepts. Are there any programs people can download off your site that they can use? Yeah. The, the website is Maxwell, my name, S-C, S for Strength and Conditioning. So MaxwellSC.com. And I have um, Isometrics 3-Way, which you can do at home and get a tremendous time static contraction isometric workout. Uh, probably the safest way you can work out, but extremely effective. I have a lot of professional athletes and amateur athletes, martial artists in this program, and they all tell me the same thing, that they just feel so incredibly strong whether they're on the wrestling mat or the playing field. Uh, I also have uh, universal mobility, which is really good. You can work and mobilize your joints every day. It's it's a form of uh, it's a form of uh, stretching, uh, more like a dynamic form of stretching, which is really good for keeping you spry and uh, keeping you young. So these are some things. Uh, I also have uh, some excellent videos on body weight calisthenics that you can do pretty much anytime, any place, anywhere. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Even if even if it's in a jail cell, I could get a great workout. It doesn't matter. And don't you also have a free a free leg workout where people could try some of the your concepts out before buying another program? Um, I think Teresa. Yeah, there, there, there's the download I shot with a young uh, personal trainer that came to um, study with me here in Port Townsend, and we just uh, video uh, a lower body leg workout that he did. So it gives you an idea of how the whole system works. Great. So just go off C.com. Cool. I'll try to get those links from uh, Teresa, and I'll we'll we'll link them up below in the description. Yeah. You can check those. Out. Yeah, no problem. Well, thanks again, Steve, for uh, taking the time to share your thoughts with all of us during this crazy, unique situation we all find ourselves in. And um, I hope to talk to you again here soon in the next few months or so. Yeah, for sure, man. I mean, I've actually been enjoying myself. I've been traveling for almost twelve years literally from country to country every couple of weeks. So it's nice to be in one spot. Uh, yeah. It's good not having to go anywhere or do anything for yeah. a change. From so, I, I, you know, I, I've been taking the most of this. I'm saying this whole thing is an opportunity just to kind of chill and relax and to charge. I'm sure I'll be ready, you know, when the quarantine's lifted to get back out there again. But, damn, it's been nice, man. I know. I feel the same way with three kids, youth sports, Business. Yeah, it's nice to be with the kids. You can play. Yeah. I will say homeschooling is worse than the virus, at least right now. Uh. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love teachers. My wife's a teacher, and now I have a different appreciation for what she does after seeing, after having to do it myself every day. So, yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah, this is a good time for families to draw themselves together, draw on their, their resources, get closer. You know, a lot of men, they work like animals and they, you know, they, they don't have enough, you know, they haven't spent that much time with the kids or the family. So it is a good time to reconnect and develop, you know, strong family ties. So, you know, there's always the, um, the silver lining in every gray cloud, you know? Yeah, for sure. All right, Steve, we'll, we'll take care. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate it. Bye now.